Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on self-care, communication, and positive relationship. I'm your host, Dr. Mo Anderson, best-selling author, award-winning podcast host, keynote speaker, and coach. Every episode, my goal is to help you review, renew, and reu by learning something new. If you're a first-timer to the show or visiting again, please go ahead and click that subscribe button to be notified of new episodes when they post. Also, please, please help me out by rating the show and leaving a comment so the platforms will suggest this program to more listeners. My guest today is Barbara Ann Mojica, aka Little Miss History. She is an author, historian, and retired educator with 40 years of experience working as a teacher, principal, and school administrator. She is the author of a series of award-winning history books for children using the whimsical character Little Miss History to narrate her book series. She makes learning history a fun-filled adventure. Parents, grandparents, educators, stay tuned. Let's learn why it's important to know your history now more than ever. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya. you. The fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? Rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure, my soul is safe. Barbara, welcome to Perpetual Motion. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit with your listeners. Awesome, awesome. Your tagline is if you don't know your history, you don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. What does that mean? I believe it, but I want you to tell us what it means to you and why it is important to know your history in 2022 and beyond. Oh, yeah. More important in 2022 than ever, I think. Well, I believe that you can't possibly understand how we got to where we are today, how to live a good life today, and how to plan to have a better life in the future if you don't know how you got here. So that's what I mean. Uh, My little character who narrates my book series, that's her motto. If you don't know your history, you don't know what you're talking about. And and I would agree completely. You know, there's that saying people who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it as well. And uh, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from history, which I just love you doing this series for children because we've got to start early uh, getting them the information that they need about their ancestors and our country and, and everything that's gone on before to get us to where we are, as you said. Why is it important, Barbara, to understand the difference between fact and opinions? And how can we teach our children to recognize each in a, in a world where we're talking about alternative facts? And <laughs> it's, it's, it's scary. Yes. Uh, what they call now disinformation. Well, a fact, as I explained to children and as we all know, is something that can be proven true. And an opinion is something that a person believes for one reason or another, that may or may not be true. Now, today in the 21st century, we are living in a world of instant communication. And for children, they are exposed to so much information at one time, but it's coming at them in a very arbitrary way. So when they go on social media, they see information presented to them. They may not see all the information presented to them because as we know, all the social media channels and networks use different algorithms. So they're only going to be seeing part of the information. Now, back in the past, we learned about things in a very different way because communication was very different. And of course, when we look at history, part of studying history is the way it was communicated and how 
people were connected to one another. So mm-hmm. in the past, it took a long time to get information. And we had more time to assimilate and go through it. Now today, we are bombarded with this instant information. And on the internet, we are being given chunks of information. And as I said, it's presented with algorithms. So what we see may only be a very small part of of the information that is out there. Mm -hmm. And children especially are very in tune to their peer groups, of course. They want to fit in with their peer groups. So they go on, they find information Some of their friends repeat this information, share this information, and that gets perpetuated. So they keep seeing it over and over again. Now they want to fit into this group. So they start to think, well, this must be true because all of my friends say it's true. And this is how we get uh, a, a whole plethora of misinformation. In the past, when we got news information, we heard the news and we were given the facts. Today, we don't hear the news. We get a piece of information and then we hear a whole panel of journalists or a whole bunch of commentators talking about that piece of information. Depending on where we are viewing that news, we're given a certain slant on that information. So we are no longer being given facts. We're being given opinions. And this is, you know, the danger of, uh, of information today. Um, When I went to college way, way back in the day, (laughs) I didn't have the the internet. So I had to go, I had to get a book out. I had to read the information. I had to digest the information. I had to take notes on the information. Then I had to compare different sources of that information. Finally, I would start to come to some kind of conclusion or analytical thinking about it. Today, we're not doing that. We're just going to the internet. We're typing in the question and looking for the answer. And often the first answer that pops up, which according again to the algorithm, when we Google it, the most popular answer is the one that's going to pop up first. And that is likely to be the information that we go with. So it's never been more important to teach children what is a fact, what is is an opinion, how are they different? And I don't think the schools are doing a very good job of that today. They're They're teaching children more what they need to think to pass the test, to meet the standard. They're, they're not teaching them the process of how to really think, how to sort through information, how to analyze it. So uh, I think uh, that's so, so important for parents to expose children to different sides uh, of, of things. Uh, when a child comes to a parent and says something, and the parent should say, oh, that's interesting, but can you think of another way of looking at that? Uh, you know, give them the opportunity to see that there are two sides to every story. Mm-hmm. And I try to do that, I, you know, in my teaching on my YouTube channel, I try to put up little videos to show them the difference between fact and opinion and do little mini lessons. But I think it's really important for parents to do this as well as teachers, because in a lot of schools, uh, I don't think it's being done adequately. And I, I think parents, you know, really have to impress that with uh, upon children right. that there there is always more than one side to a story. Yeah. There's and I just a variety. want to jump in and, and say in defense of the educators, too, as well, because I know we've got a lot of uh, listeners who are educators in Europe of former educators, that there's also a lot of pressure on them because of the standard. Oh, yes testing and other benchmarks so it's not that they don't you know necessarily it's not that they necessarily want to but they are being given a directive to teach a certain amount of information in a certain way and a certain time i know i've had experience with that we we would spend up to six weeks preparing children for tests Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and And also you made me think about when you're talking about the news because 
I'm glad you're teaching this to children because a lot of adults don't even know any more facts from opinions that just because somebody who is, you know, important or has a big title or whatever is on a panel, like you said, mm-hmm. saying it doesn't make it a fact. And and I remember watching the news when I was younger and it was, you know, fair and balanced was the phrase that they like to use because they were required to have someone with a different, you know, on the other side of an issue or with a different opinion so that you did hear all sides. They might not get as much time as the person right. whose, whose opinion they were slanted toward, but th- they don't even attempt that anymore. It is just one viewpoint and, you know, a panel of people who agree with that viewpoint and a bunch of people, as you said, giving their opinions and they're fooling adults as well. Uh, so we, this is something we all need to practice and make sure that we see the evidence, the data behind it, because that's what's missing. That's what's making it an opinion is is just what they think. And it may or may not be right. But there's there's just so much more than just listening to your favorite person and believing everything they say, no matter who it is. Why is um, our cultural heritage important and how can parents and parents play a huge role here? As you know, it, it's a team with the parents and the educators and the grandparents. How can we help children to understand and appreciate cultural heritage? Well, I think, you know, history and memory are closely tied together. We are all when, you know, we are a a combination of memories in different settings. So we are part of a family initially that when we're born, we become part of this family and our family has a memory. We have our ancestors that came before us. We have the people that we're living with today. And then we have those who will come after us, our own children and grandchildren who will come after us. So it's very important for parents to help children understand what their family is, the culture comprising their heritage, where they came from, the foods they ate, the kinds of jobs their ancestors did, the kinds of of things we're doing today, how that might change in the future. It's all kind of one evolutionary cycle. So to me, history is more evolutionary than revolutionary. There's a lot more history that is an evolutionary process and Mm -hmm. it's uh, an ongoing process. Now, when we, we move that into the community, what are our communities? Our communities are families and people who have been drawn together by some common cultural bond, uh, whether they came as an ethnic group together originally, or they were drawn together by certain opportunities in the workplace, they're bought, they're, they're bound together by a, a common kind of heritage. And that involves culture, again, sharing food, sharing traditions, sharing certain kinds of events. Or they're, they're bound together as a community. and that kind of gives them a historical culture and identity too. And then of course our communities involve engaged citizens and it's important for the citizens to understand their heritage and background because not only uh, are they influenced by the leadership of the past, but they have to use what those people did and thought about and celebrated to form some kind of legacy. How are we going to use what we learned as a foundation for what we're doing today? And then serving as a framework of what we want to preserve from the past. Uh, we There are probably certain things we want to get rid of that haven't worked out so well. And there are certain things that we want to build on and grow and enhance. So it, it preserves and and forms a kind of framework or legacy uh, sharing certain documents, artifacts, images, pictures, all of that becomes a part of who we are. And eventually that extends out to the global community as well. You know, it extends to our image of who we are in our family, our community, 
our local government, our national government, and ultimately how we think and feel and act in the wider worldwide community as well. Well, yeah, and we are all connected. And I think also this is something that I did with my children. We, uh, I have a family member who's traced our family back for seven generations and I did it individually. And whenever we had a family reunion, we would talk about the family's history. And, and I could see for my kids as well that it really installed a sense of self-confidence and pride and self-worth as well uh, or contributed to that. That wasn't the only factor, but, but there's some benefits to knowing, you know, like you said, what your ancestors did, whether it was agriculture or industrial and the movement and, and the trade and, and all of that. And we're a culmination of, of what they did, their achievements and their sacrifices. Um, and then I like the way you tied it to the global community because we are just getting in these little silos and, and forgetting how connected we all are. Um, ultimately, we, you know, we need each other to survive. What is um, each person's, each individual's role and responsibility as a character in history? Well, some of what we talked about before as, as a part of this culture and heritage, but history is also about what people did every day. So some people think of history just as the big events, the Battle of Gettysburg, sure. the signing yeah. of the Declaration of Independence, the French Revolution, the fall of the Bastille. But it really is more of a story about individual people. Sometimes I, when I talk to kids, I kind of compare it to a reality show that each of us is kind of like a character who has their own unique makeup and talent and skill. And the moment we're born, we become a part of the story because again, our family, our community is already there. Mm -hmm. And we now become a part of it. So we now have an opportunity to make our own history and to connect ourselves to the rest of our family, the rest of our community, the rest of our country, and, and eventually the world. So uh, we all have a part to play. That that's you know my point that we are all a part of this giant story that has begun before us. We don't get just plunked down in the middle of something. It's been going on for thousands and thousands of years before us, and hopefully will go on for thousands of years after us. But we have an opportunity to play a role, to live a, a good life, to improve conditions for ourselves and others. And hopefully to make some kind of con contribution that will form a, a legacy for someone in the future to build upon. And that's that's well stated and should be all of our mission is to make, you know, make things better to improve upon what we've inherited. How did your, you've got a wonderful children's series, you've written several books, uh, award-winning series, how did the series come about? Well, the series came about when I retired. I retired from my very long career in teaching. And I realized very, very quickly that sitting around was not going to be something in my wheelhouse. And <laughs> I'm I, not good at that either. <laughs> I really wanted to put together kind of like the skills that I have collected along the way. Mm -hmm. And I majored uh, in history. I have graduate and undergraduate degrees in history. I wanted to go back to history because, because I love history and I feel it is so important. So I wanted to take that and to take my love of teaching and combine them. So I 
this, first I started to write local uh, articles on, on history for a, a local news magazine. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do something for children. So my husband, who is an artist, decided he would help me out. He said, why don't you have a, a character to narrate your stories? Because I wanted to make them entertaining. Right. At, at the same time, I, I wanted them to be carefully researched history, but to be entertaining. So he said, I can create a character for you to narrate the series. And that's what we did. Uh, we created the Little Miss History character. And she's a, a, actually a younger version of me. So even mm-hmm. though she's a cartoony like character with exaggerated features, she has the pigtails that I used to wear. She has a hiking outfit because I used to hike and like to explore in the mountains and travel. She wears these oversized hiking boots because they're in memory of my father's huge feet. And she has these uh, sunglasses that are, again, kind of oversized and funny, but they're rose colored because they reflect an optimistic uh, and uh, you know, a rose, rose-colored glasses, looking at the world through an optimistic viewpoint. So that's how she came to be, and she narrates the series. And uh, I choose places that are sometimes iconic and very w- well known, like Mount Rushmore or the Statue of Liberty. I also go into other disciplines connected to history well actually er, to me everything's connected to history Mm -hmm. so some of my books explore national parks Uh, so with those books I look at the groups that were living and exploring in the parks they could be Native American groups they could be the early white settlers they could be uh, african-american groups i i look at all of these areas i look at nature i look at science so in my sequoia national park book we talk about the science of the sequoias the geology of the park we talk about how amazing these sequoia trees are that they grow from seeds that are only a half inch long and grow into these magnificent trees. We also talk about things like uh, human rights. So in the Mount Rushmore book, not only do we talk about the process of building it, uh, the uh, monumental process of blasting the rock and how it took 40 years to build. And we also talk about the Native American rights that were taken away. We talk about how the land was taken from the Lakota Sioux and mm-hmm. and how the the Native Americans protested and they're now building their own monument near Mount Rushmore, the Crazy Horse Memorial. Let, so let me I just jump you, in and, and say that I appreciate that. We we discussed this when we got to chat earlier because I asked you, you know, is there diversity in your in your books, in your history books, because as you know, in the past, that's been lacking in a lot of the mm. textbooks. And your your husband is a great illustrator too. I don't want to forget to make that point because I've seen the character and and the covers and some of the interior. And he is that's just an amazing uh collaboration. And I'm happy for you on that. But it it's just so important that our history, United States history be as diverse and comprehensive as our community. And I'm glad to see that that's changing slowly, but surely in academia, we even just had a Juneteenth holiday, which I never thought I'd see in my life. So just kudos to you and keep up the good work. I just, just wanted to comment on that, that, that I appreciate the, the uh, attempt to include, you know, all the ethnicities and people and, and racial groups who have contributed to our great country. It's very important that children see themselves in our history. Right. And, it, uh, you know, there are a lot of figures that were forgotten, like Alonzo Swan. It took him 50 years to get the Bronze Star. He mm-hmm. was one of the heroes on the Intrepid to prevent the ship from blowing up. Uh, and, 
you know, Matthew Henson, who traveled with Admiral Perry to the North Pole, turns out he was with him on almost all of his expeditions and planned a lot of them. So wow. he actually was even more instrumental than Admiral Perry was. And, you know, people that were just not known, the uh, Anderson Rufford Abbott, who was a surgeon who was present at Ford's Theater when Lincoln was, was assassinated. He was there on a date with, uh, with um, Mary, Todd Lincoln's maid, Elizabeth Keckley, who was a free Black woman. Mm -hmm. She was on a date with him at the theater when it happened. And he, he was a friend of the family. And uh, he's... Wow. Uh, he was given a shawl uh, of Lincoln's by Mary, Mary Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of little pieces of history that are, you know, often neglected. And, and it's important for children to see, again, the influence of people that are not as widely known, but the important part that they play. And I try to make my books interactive. So I ask children questions throughout. I ask for their opinions. I ask them, what would, what do they think about it? What would they do about it? And we're, we're not doing enough of that either. So many, uh, so many great uh, instructional tips you're giving here for, for parents and for teachers, because there's a, a lot of lecturing and not enough uh, mm -hmm. interactive and and kids need to be able they need to practice expressing their thoughts as well and and sometimes I love chatting with my grandkids because if I can be quiet long enough they say some of the most enlightening and and funny and right. fun things and, and Out of the mouths of babes right yes <laughs> yes and sometimes you know we really underestimate their ability to comprehend things and to you know have an opinion about it so that's that's a lot of fun. And I would encourage everyone to to just carve out some time. It's not just quality time watching Netflix, but carve out some time for discussion, conversation, turning off all of that, reading books like yours and really getting to know not just history, but getting to know each other, which we, we can always spend more time on that. Are there do you have a, a favorite book? You've written so many great Great books. Uh, you know, that's like picking your favorite child. Favorite <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, so many of them. Um, I like the Sequoia book because that encompasses so many different things. Mm -hmm. I, I like the North Pole book because that one, again, encompasses different questions and different countries. And that's one that I have not personally visited. Uh, most of my books have photography, they're mixed media. So in addition to the, uh, the narrated character and the, uh, pro the portraits and, pro and profiles of people, we usually have actual photography from the site but of course in the north pole book i don't have that so in that book there are a lot of maps and flags and uh we have talking about the eight countries that that are involved in the arctic region we talk about their different Wait, did you countries. say there are eight countries in the arctic that, region? in the arctic region yeah really? that have territor territorial claim the actual you know it sits in international waters but various parts of it are claimed by different countries. Ah. So we talk about their interests. We talk about the Santa Claus story. Of course, we can't leave out Santa Claus. So of we course. talk about how that whole story evolved, uh, the myth, the Scandinavian myth, and then the, the Christian uh, parts of the story, the, the uh, St. Nicholas and the and different countries use different names. And then we talk about the night before Christmas and how that supposedly was written by Clement Moore, but maybe not, maybe it oh. wasn't, maybe it was written by Robert Livingston. So we talk about climate, we talk about nature, we talk about wildlife, we talk about history, we talk about ge a little bit about geography, and we talk about literature, we talk about the poem and we and we talk about the whole Santa Claus story and how it became popularized and advertised and the whole so that one is very very diverse so I you know I like that one 
a lot. Sounds, sounds interesting. And I like the way your eyes lit up, even as you were <laughs> talking about it. You've been re- really high energy the whole time, which I, I love because it's early in the morning and, and I've got you here doing an interview. Thank you so much for your time. But anyone can hear that you're very knowledgeable and enthusiastic about this topic. And so if listeners want to learn more, if they want to get a book, engage with you, how can they find you online, connect with you, learn more about your books and services? Well, I'm easy to find online. The best place to go is my website, which is simply uh, www.littlemisshistory.com. From there, they can get anywhere. So on my website, I have a, a link for a direct chat or to email me. I have my books, uh, a little snippet from each of the 14 books that are released so far, and there will be another one coming in a couple of months. Uh, I have testimonials and reviews uh, where to buy the books. They're available worldwide, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, independent Mm -hmm. bookstores and anywhere. I have my blog on my blog. I do book reviews twice a week. So I do family friendly reviews and I review books for Anyone in the family from toddler through young adult and adult. I have tips for authors. I have tips for parents and teachers on my blog. I have a YouTube channel. They can click on that. I have teaching videos. So I have two minute teacher short videos. Uh, I talk about citizenship and fact and opinion. I talk about history, but I also talk about all other parts of the curriculum. So I have videos on reading and math and science and all kinds of things. Uh, And I have kids history videos where kids can learn about history told by kids and national parks as well. Uh, And then I have the standard uh, YouTube, uh, the standard social media channels that they can link uh, up with LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and so on. So the website is really, you know, go there and then at one click to any Got it. littlemisshistory.com. I will include that in the show notes along with your bio and all the interesting topics we've discussed today. And good luck. I know your next book is going to be great and hopefully a bestseller for you. Continue success with what you're doing. And thank you so much for making history interesting and engaging for our children. Thanks for the opportunity to share. I really enjoyed our conversation. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group. And I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.